Um, good morning, everyone. Ah, okay, I hope you're doing well. Um, so I work for the ONET project of the Open University um, as a researcher into open education resources. Um, this presentation is actually a, a joint work between myself and my colleague, Alexandra Okada, who works in the Knowledge Media Institute of the Open University. Uh, she couldn't be here today, uh, but that's her. Okay, so I'll start um, by, by talking about mentoring, by talking a little bit about my trajectory uh, into studying how mentoring occurs uh, in terms of repurposing OER. So back in 2006, the Open University launched its OER repository, OpenLearn. And I used to work for OpenLearn from the beginning as a researcher, and my role there was to try and understand how people would use the content. So first of all, who would be the users, what they would use the content for, and how. So really try and monitor and understand what happened in the, in the, in the website uh, and whether there was any learning actually taking place, okay? So the story is that when we first launched the website, uh, we started to upload the Open University content. Um, we, we, we could monitor some download and the use. So people would go to the site to study, they would see the courses that we call units, they would download, we were using web analytics to follow the downloads. But actually, I didn't have much data to be able to do a study on repurposing. Right. So, because the website was in, in its very early days, we didn't uh, have enough data on that. So we decided to set up a focus group with some teachers. Uh, they were language teachers um, of the Milton Keynes Adult Continuing Education. And uh, the reason why we chose language teachers was because they were, most of the materials we had in Open Learn at the time were language materials like Spanish, Italian, and German, right? So we thought they would have content in which to, to work with. And the goal of that w focus group was to get some data. So we basically introduced the, the initiative to them. We introduced them to the concept of open educational resources. And we showed them what they could do with all the tools, with the content. Uh, we said, well, you can adapt, you can translate. See if it's of any value to you to enhance your class, okay, your lessons. Uh, and, and it was a very interesting study. So what happened is that uh, they played with the website, they chose content that they liked, and the outcome was that they said, well, this is a brilliant idea, we love the concept of open educational resources, we think it's extremely valuable, we love the website, it's a great initiative, but uh, we find it daunting. Okay, it's intimidating, uh, and, um, uh, and for many reasons, not only because of the technological reasons, there is a, a steep learning curve for us to, to deal with this concept of getting someone else's material and rework it, because this is something we are not used to in our daily lives, but also to understand how to use the technology, but, but above all, we don't really have the time to put into it. We wish we had, we would like to have, but in our daily lives, we can't really find the time to go through that steep learning curve. But this is brilliant. So it was positive and negative in that sense. But that was a very interesting case because afterwards we said, well, maybe what we should do next was to, uh, um, to try and support some uh, institutional collaboration, right? So we, we started to uh, work with institutions, uh, giving initial support for them to upload content, to repurpose content, to start using content in OpenLearn, so that we would have more cases to study, right? This is in the very beginning, from 2006 to 2008. The institutional collaborations with initial mentoring, initial support in, repurposes, in repurposing content were very, very successful, okay? So I have, for example, one example of a Brazilian university that we worked with uh, since 2007. And they not only translated open learn content into uh, English, into, into Portuguese, sorry, but they also uploaded their own content, content that they considered quality content to, to showcase to the world. 
they uploaded into the website, and they also translated the content uh, into, into English. Okay? And, and they've been running courses during their winter break using OER, extending these courses to the community. So not only their students, but the families of their students. So it's an incredible case of success. And we have lots of cases of institutional collaboration and repurposing that counted with a little mentoring in the beginning that were very successful. So given that, so these institutional collaborations happened in the lab space uh, of the Open Learn, which is ex an experimental area. It's an area in which people can go and play with the content, upload and repurpose, etc. So they all have uh, areas in this project space area you can see there on your left hand side. Well, as a result, when you were reviewing the project, the first two years of the project from 2006-2008, we uh, dedicated a whole session of the Open Learn Research Report, which is available online uh, for anyone who is interested to take a look. We dedicated a whole section into, uh, into discussing uh, the role of collaboration and mentoring, okay? Institutional mentoring in, in particular, mentoring individuals, but also trying to, to sell the idea to stakeholders. And in this report, uh, I, I uh, put mentoring in evidence because we, are, we identified mentoring as in, an important part of this process of repurposing OER. We noticed that by giving people some initial guidance just at the beginning, it would take off. They started doing things by, them, by themselves, such as in this case of the Brazilian university that I mentioned. So it was just in the beginning some mentoring, some teaching how to use the site or how to repurpose was absolutely essential. Okay, so in that particular case, historically from 2006 to 2008, we thought that mentoring was about initial support, yeah, and we st still believe that in, in certain cases. But since then, a lot more activity has been happening in the website in a number of ways. And then uh, we decided to go on uh, and start researching other things that were going on in the site. So we have more data now. So after this experience with this uh, collaboration, collaborating with institutions, I uh, took part of, uh, of um, the writing of a section for the master's course in, in open and distance education uh, of the Open University. And I wrote a section about how to repurpose OER. Okay? This section is now available as an OER in the learning space uh, of, of, this, of the Open Learn. But the goal here was to introduce the master's students uh, into OER, but also into repurpose. It was a, a hands-on activity that I created here in order to make them work with the content so we would see how they would perceive that. Okay, so this is the course. Well, in, at the OU, we use lots of codes. Now, so you can see the, the course code is H800. It divides in, divided into blocks. This block that I mentioned is on week 10. Uh, it's, it's written week 10B, repurposing open educational content. So this is, a, this is a Moodle environment. This is then, therefore, formal learning, just to clarify, as the students pay for this course and they will get a certificate when they finish. So we are talking about formal learning here. And so this course was offered, uh, had two presentations, 2009, 2010. I'm talking about now a case study from the presentation of 2009. Uh, today, in my talk, I'm going to present two, briefly two cases. One is this one uh, of this 8800 course, and another one is the CoLearn community, which is a case developed by my colleague Alexandre Cado. Um, so, 8800 is a formal learning course in which the, the main goal was to repurpose content, okay? And the difference between this case and the, the case of CoLearn is that CoLearn is an informal community that was created in the lab space, that experimental space that I showed you, for practitioners, educators, to talk about the various things they are interested in. So, to talk about, for example, they'll talk about e-democracy, they'll talk about teaching approaches, they'll talk about collaborative learning, they'll talk about technologies. So, it, it's an informal space in which only people that are really interested join the community. And this is the sort of, of activity that we're hoping to happen in the website and that is happening now, okay? So, um, because these activities are happening, both of them, in the lab space, this is space that people can change and repurpose the content, uh, it's implicit that everything that is produced there is OER. 
Yeah. So everything you do, even if you have a, a, a web video conference, uh, if because you have the replay, it's made available to the public as an OER, so other people can benefit from all the activity in the website. So that's how we see repurposing there. So in the case of CoLearn, repurposing was not the main goal, but it was a desired outcome for the participants of this community. They wanted to be able to use their resources to create further resources that will help them. Uh, uh, to uh, enhance uh, their uh, teaching skills, etc. So as I mentioned, what these cases have in common is that both of them are open university cases. At ONET, what we are looking at at the moment is evidence, right? Because we know there are a number of in initiatives that offer content, but we are interested to see if we can find evidence of, in my case in particular, my focus on reuse and repurposing. And we thought that these two cases were open university cases, but were cases of evidence. Uh, my colleague Yota, that is here in the audience, is looking at evidence from other institutions, such as peer-to-peer -peer university, and in which she's also looking for evidence of repurposing. So we are trying to scan um, the field. Okay, so first case study. 2009, 100 plus students registered, divided into seven tutor groups. What I'm looking at here is forum data, so it's not their repurposing activity, but the discussions they had in the forum about the experience of, of repurposing, okay? And obviously, we had to have permission granted by the institution, by the learners, by, by the tutors to be able to carry out, to, for me to be able to have access to the forums, okay? So we are considering uh, the ethical aspects of research. The goal to transform a unit uh, from the English into something else, maybe a translation, an adaptation, uh, they, sometimes they change pictures, so the level in which they are repurposing vary from very little to a comp completely new unit, let's say. So the in-situ editing tool, this is a Moodle environment for the ones who know, means that any user uh, of the lab space can choose a unit and simply edit it. You see a circled uh, turn editing on, so if you press that button, you can start repurposing, changing, deleting, etc., and only you can do that. Nobody else can do anything else uh, um, with your unit. Uh, when you finish, you press that button again, turn editing off, and it's locked, and the unit is ready to be used with other people. Um, so I created a step-by-step -step guide for them on how to repurpose, so they had guidance. Uh, this is part of what is available now as OER in the learning space. You see the, with blue arrows showing exactly where to go, what to press. So they had guidance in there and with textual guidance as well. And as a result, we, have, we had a number of units repurposed. We were working with a particular unit which was about alcohol and human health because we just thought it was a, a theme that was in the media all the time when, when I was writing the course. And so there are many versions of this unit, so copies of the original, on all different ones. So if you look in, in parentheses, you can see the versions. The first one is 2.8, the second one 2.9, and if you look down, you have two you have 3.0, yeah? So when you have a minor change in the unit, you have 2.8, 2.9. When you have a major change in the unit, then it becomes 2.3 or 2.4, yeah? Does that make sense? So you kind of so, sort of can know whether it's a major change or a minor change and the user chooses that. Okay, now, what happened when I was analyzing the, f the, the, the forums in which students were discussing the experience of repurposing? Some categories were emergent, right? I have to say, this is work in progress, right? But, but the categories emergent were fear, respect. So most students said, well, we respect the content. We are used to respect other, pe other people's work, authorship, copyright. You know, we find it a bit strange to be able to repurpose the material, okay? But maybe it's a culture problem. Maybe it will change. Um, or maybe I can, it's open university content, can I really do any better than that? You know, they were kind of afraid of not being able to, uh, to offer uh, online in a, in a public space something better than, than that was, was already there. Some of them didn't have confidence, felt intimidated, but at the same time there were many words of encouragement between themselves, okay, to go ahead and do it. 
So this is just a snapshot of my data, okay, uh, of these forum messages. So in this case, learner A is, is saying that this, is, this was a daunting experience. So just to make a connection, do you remember that in the beginning I said that in 2006, this is exactly what the teacher said. This, was, this is a daunting experience, really intimidating. Four years later, it, still, it seems that it is still is a daunting experience, repurposing content. So maybe this is something for us to think about. Maybe there is a gap there that we can work towards, um, um, towards removing this fear somehow. Um, so they say, well, maybe I, I'm afraid that will damage the content, right? Then student B comes in and said, well, don't worry, this is the encouragement. You're, you're working on the copy of the material, copy of the original, so yeah, you can do everything you want. And then student C steps in and says, well, you may not damage the material, but it's still all the, all the same. Uh, we have respect for people's text, and uh, perhaps it's not something for ourselves, it's something for a younger generation. You know, this generation we, we describe sometimes as digital natives. Okay, thank you. So this is very interesting, right? because the theme seems to be repeating itself. Now, mentoring. How mentoring happened there? It was performed as peer mentoring. One student mentoring the other was mostly related about their feelings, how they felt about repurposing. It wasn't as much about the technology because they had the guidance, okay? Uh, they gave advice to each other, and it was distributed. There wasn't a single person being the mentor, okay? Everybody had something to say to each other or contributed to each other. Now, moving on to the second case, CoLearn. This is work of my colleague, Alexandra. This is a community, as I said, of professionals. This community is mostly in Portuguese and in Spanish, okay? And here is where people uh, freely get together to talk about uh, their educational interests. Okay, so this is, this is an example of, uh, of um, an activity in this community around uh, a um, software called Compendium that is offered in the, in the OpenLearn website developed by the Knowledge Media Institute in which these teachers were exchanging resources that they had, okay, so they knew that the new resources they created there would be OER, uh, would be available to everybody else, and they were um, trying to, um, as a community, to put together the resources they had and create a map. So if you click in those buttons, it, they will take you to different URLs, they will take you to different resources. So they were creating this map together and the idea was to share and edit the map. In this case, technology mentoring was something very interesting because some users knew how to use the website better than the others, okay? So there was a lot of mentoring in terms of how to use the technology. In the second case I'm, I'm showing here, um, the discussion was based in a web video conference tool of the Open University, which is called um, FM, uh, previous flash meeting. And the professionals were talking about information literacy, okay? So they are all teachers trying to decide and define what is information literacy to exchange content, etc. And in this case, what we realize is that this, the mentoring happened not so much in terms of the technology, but in terms of the concepts, you know. And here you can see clearly how they are working in, in that uh, concept of zone of proximal development of Vygotsky that is, is very much about collaborative learning, in which if a learner has a limitation to understand something because they are interacting in a community that will perhaps uh, give them more ideas, more resources, they will use that to improve their knowledge and they will achieve a different level in that understanding. So that's what Vygotsky termed zone of collaborative development, uh, of proximal development that is characteristic of collaborative learning activities. We can see that happening very interestingly there. So mentoring was conceptual, let's put it this way. And the same happened with this third case in which they are discussing e-democracy. Do we have a couple of minutes more? One minute, okay. So as I say, mentoring was about technical support, different from the first case because they didn't have much guidance, um, operated at a conceptual level, and was also distributed. And I have to say, this term distributed, I'm coining from my colleague here, Iota, because uh, although it's not in the literature, uh, you know, I thought uh, that it describes really well this idea that mentoring is not localized. Now, the provisional conclusions from these cases, Mentoring appears to be on this continuum, localized action and distributed mentoring. What do I mean by that? Because there is always an action take pl taking place. In the beginning, there was a course, there was an activity, so there was action there, prompting, repurposing, repurposing 
very rarely happens by itself. You know, it's usually, it usually needs some sort of circumstance to enable uh, repurposing to happen. But in both cases, although there was this localized action with someone organizing a community or creating a course, those people were not actually the main mentors. The mentoring was distributed in the community, okay? With this idea that everybody has something to share. And this seems to be an effective way to encourage the repurposing of OER. So as I said, um, this is work in progress. We have to move on to, to perhaps analyze the data more systematically, uh, perhaps creating a, an approach, I don't know, grounded theory, discourse analysis, so we can replicate this data with other cases. You are not claiming for generalizability. But maybe if we replicate this study with other cases, we'll be able to, at some point, picture a bit better how repurposing occurs in open spaces. Okay, this is it for the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. Has anybody got any questions they would like to ask on that work that she's been undertaking? No questions. Yes, yes, it, it, it is, um, well, as researchers, we are really just um, trying to, to gather data, yeah. Although in the beginning, in the beginning, uh, when we first started, uh, we started presenting open learning conferences, and then some institutions would say, oh, we want to do something with the website, can you help us? At that time, we needed data desperately, so we said, yes, yes, let's, ha let's work together. So that's how some collaborations started. But nowadays, there is so much activity in the site that we simply don't have enough staff and time to do that, unfortunately. But, you know, and that's why the unit on repurposing, uh, that, that unit that I showed is, is available for free now to try and, and fill in that gap. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, one question. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, this is this is, would be brilliant. Now, every researcher looks for data. Yeah. The only problem is that it's very difficult to create communities. Communities. You know, we kind of support them, um, and they usually are born out of some sort of interest. You know, in the ca in the case of Alexandra Scholar, she brought in with her previous communities that she was already working with in Brazil, with Portugal, etc. So that's why. Um, but yes, if there is the opportunity to work with an emergent community, yes, definitely. There is another. Okay. That's perfect. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, well just one more question. And then. Okay. Perfect, excellent idea, thank you. Okay, okay thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much.